Welcome to the War here, and today we're doing another tier list using Tier Maker. This time we're revisiting the Cathay unit roster tier list and uh, updating it for the various changes and additions that they've gone through. But just like with all other tier lists, I do need to let you guys know that this video here is sponsored by Manscaped. So you guys know I've been with Manscaped for ages now, love the product, love working with them, and you'll also know if you watch my live streams, I've got quite a beard at the moment. Now what I typically do with growing a beard is that I just keep growing it, don't really put much maintenance into it until it starts to get annoying, like when I'm eating and then beard hairs start getting in my mouth, and then I just shave the whole thing off when it starts to get uncomfortable. However, now that I've got the beard hedger, what I can do is just very quickly put it on a high setting and just trim my beard in the places where it's annoying me very quickly to just keep it exactly the way I want it in as little amount of time as possible. And that's exactly what I need in order to basically keep my beard. So if you're like me and you like to grow a fairly big beard and you also don't like putting a lot of effort into maintaining your beard, I'd highly recommend giving the Beard Hedger a go. Check out Manscaped, link in the description and in the pinned comment where you can get free international shipping and 20% off. Big thanks to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Okay, with that being said, let's get into the tier list itself. Now, just like with all of my other unit roster tier lists, it's not the case that the highest stat unit or the highest tier unit ends up in S tier and the lowest tier units end up in D tier. Sometimes low tier units will actually end up in S tier and it really comes down to value. Taking a unit and making it punch way above its pay grade in many situations, those are the S tier ones. And units that are highly specialized are only useful in very few situations, have a lot of upkeep costs and maybe very minimal amount of boosting, those are the ones that are gonna be lower value. You know, they might be fun to use and it's totally fine to use them, but they may not help you win battles a lot of the time. Okay, so with that being said, let's actually get into it. So, the um, starting with the tier zero units, we've got the Peasant Long Spearman. I'm gonna put this one here at B tier. Now this is essentially one of the weakest units in your roster, but it serves a purpose, especially in the early stage of the campaign, because in the early stages, you just don't have access to your entire roster, very limited supply of income. So having a cheap unit that you can use to hold the line that is very easily replaced has a lot of value. So these perform pretty much exactly where they're supposed to. You recruit them in the early stage of the campaign. Very early on, as soon as you've got 10 settlements, you can globally recruit them in one turn. So very very quick to replace them in emergency situations it's early game anti-large as well and you can boost them a fair bit in your lord skill tree and in the tech tree but i would be phasing these guys out fairly early on then we've got the peasant archers i'm going to put this one at eight here because you're going to lean on this one a bit heavier if you want real value in your army because this one punches much higher above its pay grade than the peasant spears because these ones here are able to dish out damage without receiving damage they've got a decent amount of ammunition and the game ranks them really lowly so if a single unit of peasant archers is able to wipe out like a goblin unit throughout its ammunition then it's essentially done its worth so sometimes having lots and lots of trash units is actually better than having a smaller, more elite army. And there's an important strat in the early stages of the campaign, because you've got limited build slots, to not build military buildings and instead build economic buildings. And then once you start getting to tier two and tier three, as you open up your build slots and you've already built your economic buildings, then you start building the military buildings. And that's when you would start to phase these guys out. But this is a unit that you can get a lot of value on, but you know, around tw turn 20 and 30, you probably want to start phasing them out, apart from maybe just legacy armies, armies that have just been hanging around for ages, and you may not have enough funds to replace them with better units. You shouldn't just disband them just because a better unit is available. Okay, now we move on to the Jade Warrior. So this is the first unit that requires a barracks. Now, previously, the barracks wasn't as high value as it is now. Because of the addition to the Gate Masters, that's the only way to increase the capacity of that hero. It's now worth it to build as many of those of those uh, barracks as possible at tier three to get as many of those heroes, especially considering that hero boosts these guys by an absolute ton. If we go and have a look in a campaign here, this is the Yuan Bo campaign that I was playing on a live stream recently. I've been playing it in my own time. As you can see here, I've pretty much got full control of Cathay now. Confederated the other two legendary lords happened a couple of turns after the campaign ended on the live stream. If we have a look at this army here, what we can do with gate masters is kind of absurd. Apart from them just being really good units, as in they can hold the line fairly well, and just add a decent amount of missile damage, the Jade standard here is the real value in the Gate Master. 
reducing the upkeep cost of Jade Warriors of all type and Jade Lancers, but we'll get to that later, and increasing the melee defense of those units. And this is something that stacks. So if you put multiple of these heroes into an army and each of them have this, it will stack each time. So you, if you put 10 of them into an army, you can potentially reduce the upkeep cost of these units by 100% and increase their melee defense by 60 with that. So you can make some pretty ridiculously strong stacks of Jade Warriors using these guys. Now, I'm not saying that you should put 10 of them in there. I'm saying that you could. Uh, honestly, just a couple of them still is providing an absolute ton of value because six melee defense is nothing to scoff at, especially considering that the Lord Skill Redline Tree for boosting um, Jade Warriors, melee attack plus six and melee defense plus six, that is nothing to scoff at as well. Plus, there is tons in the tech tree that also boost them. So you've got a super cheap unit that you can boost the stats of like crazy, which will help you in auto resolve if you're getting campaign fatigue. So if you just want to speed things up along, um, so you can make a bunch of really cheap auto resolve stacks with Jade Warriors. That is very easy to replace because if you're building a lot of these barracks, you are able to globally recruit them very quickly as soon as you've got 10 barracks. The reason why this one here is two turns is because I haven't got 10 tier 3 barracks yet in this campaign. And it's only turn 41. So you can get that very early on. So all of these are going to end up in S tier. Because what you can potentially do with them, they punch so far above their pay grade right now that it's kind of ridiculous. So absolutely insane units. I highly recommend getting your armies filled with these as soon as you can and pumping in those gate masters. Okay, then we've got the Celestial Dragon Guard. Now previously I probably would have put this at S tier unit because this is a super strong unit. But the gate master doesn't boost it. This is a tier 4 unit. So you're going to get these guys way earlier, and by the time you start getting these guys, you you should, if, you, if you're playing the campaign well, already have these pretty heavily boosted to the point where the stat differences between this one and this one is actually pretty negligible, but these ones will actually be more expensive. So I'm going to put this one at A tier, not because it isn't a high stat unit, just because it's kind of more value to have um, the, uh, the Jade Warriors. Then we've got the Celestial Dragon Crossbowmen. Now, although you can't boost them quite as much as you can with the, the Jade Crossbowmen, this one is still going into S tier because it actually serves a higher purpose. See, these ones here, if we go into the stats, we can actually have a look at this stuff. If we have a look at the Jade Warrior Halberds, they do armor piercing and anti-large, but they don't have shields, right? These ones here, the main advantage is just they've got shields Higher stats, but of course, you know, these ones here, melee defense 38 compared to melee defense 43. You don't need many gate masters to get these guys to have higher melee defense, essentially. It's totally up to you if you want to go for it, but it's also a significantly more expensive unit. But when it comes to Celestial Dragon Crossbowmen, they've got an edge over the Jade Warrior Crossbowmen. So they've got shields as well, but what it comes down to is the missile strength. This one here having armor piercing will make it far more valuable in the later stages of the campaign. Even if you're not ridiculously boosting the melee defense like you can with these. So they might have lower combat stats, but that armor piercing is going to be way more useful. Especially if you're going up against armies of high tier uh, Chaos Wolves, uh, Warriors of Chaos. Really just any kind of late game army that's got armored units. Uh, you're going to want to have more Celestial Dragon Crossbowmen because it doesn't matter how much melee defense your unit has. If you don't have any armor piercing, you're probably not going to overcome those units very well. So this is definitely a unit that you probably want to prioritize and you can get a lot of value out of it as soon as it's available. You know, tier five, it's not going to come in very early. Now, this is also a unit that is heavily boosted by Miao Ying. So this is kind of the unit to recruit for her army. You can just get ridiculous results out of these. But it being a high value unit, meaning if you don't get those shots in and it gets killed, it can actually really hurt you a lot more than, for example, if a um, Jade Warrior or Peasant Archer got shot. So if you're going to recruit them, just be careful not to get them killed because they're so high value. Okay, then moving on to the Iron Hail Gunners. This is a tier 3 unit that's recruited from the Artillery Building. So it's definitely worth recruiting that building. Um, but I don't think this is as high value as it used to be. So I'm going to put it at B tier. Simply because it is so much more value to get these guys here. This one does have armor piercing missiles. But it's very short range. And so you're just not going to get as much utility out of that. Compared to having much longer range. Uh, so that's why I'm going to put it there. Still a good unit has its value, would not spam it though. Then we've got the um, the crane gunners here. These are much better because these are longer range units with armor piercing. These are essentially Giselles. 
I'm going to put it at A tier because they do very well in Miao Ying's army. But I just don't think they've got as much bouncer power pushing capabilities as what these ones here do. But of course, if this is a unit that you really love, chucking a couple of these in your army, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. A tier is a good tier to be in. But I just would not spam them due to them being kind of finicky. And uh, just not, you can't boost them quite as much as you can with these guys here. And boosting, boosting the stats and the range and the ammunition, that kind of stuff, that will have a, a lot of value throughout the course of your campaign versus units that you just don't get quite as many boosts on. Okay, then moving on to the cavalry. So, we got the peasant horseman here. This is a piece of crap. It goes straight in the trash. I would pretty much ignore this in all my campaigns. If we go and have a look, this is really what I was talking about before about barracks that I don't bother with. So, if it was just recruited at a at the like tier zero like these guys here i'd probably consider recruiting them like a couple of them because they can be very good distractions in the early stage of the campaign but because you've got to build a cavalry building this is a low value building to produce because it doesn't provide anything else it doesn't provide income doesn't provide heroes and the units that are recruited from here are pretty mediocre at best but as for this one here i would not be building this at tier one at the very earliest, I would be building it for, for when I'm at tier 3, and maybe even at tier 4 when I've got a major settlement. So this is a very skippable unit. There is much higher priority units to recruit. Maybe sticking one or two in an army, maybe, if that's really what you want to do. But apart from that, you are not going to get much value out of this unit because it just isn't able to beat anything. It's able to run units down, for sure, but most of the time, by the time you've inflicted army losses on the enemy, you've already killed like 80 to 90% of them anyway. So running down the last remainder of them, unless the battle went really badly for you and you need to kill every last one of them, it's just it's just not that high value. Uh, but it's entirely up to you. You know, some people like them. Um, I personally think that they're absolute trash. Then we've got the Jade Lancers. Now, this being a tier 3 cavalry unit that can, is boosted to the same extent that these guys here are boosted, they're actually much higher value now, which is why this one here went down so much. I think that was a D tier before. Now, I think I put this one at B tier before, but because the Gate Master is able to boost them so much, getting an army of Jade Lancers, like nothing but Jade Lancers and uh, Gate Masters, you can make essentially an army of free cavalry that can maybe support your army, just run around. I wouldn't use it for sieges, and has super high melee defense, so it can charge into something. Probably won't dish out that much damage, but get and pull out without getting absolutely wrecked. This is a unit that I would actually put at A tier now, if you build it in conjunction with the um, with the Gate Master. It's still recruited from a low priority building, and I still way prefer getting Jade Warriors. But if you've really got a boner for heavy cavalry, this is now quite a viable unit. I would totally skip this one though. And then we've got the um, the Long Mariders. Um, I don't think these are particularly high value. They don't have any real speciality. It says anti-infantry, but they don't have an anti-infantry bonus. They're not particularly high stats, and they're a tier 5 unit. I'm going to put this one at B tier, just because there's not really that much you can do with it by the time that you do get them. Unless, of course, you start off with them in the campaign. Again, just having a look over here. Like They're, they're a tier 5 unit. They don't belong there at tier 5 in my opinion. Very expensive, and for the stats that you get with no speciality, really, the fact that it says anti-infantry there doesn't really mean anything. Um, these are units that are going to struggle to find their place on the battlefield. Like, if there's a high tier, like, let's just say a tier 3 melee infantry unit that's not anti-large, and you charge into it, this unit, there's a good chance that this one here will still lose. So, it's not much of a bounce of power push. It requires a lot of micro. There's just better units to recruit in the roster. Not a terrible one, but I'm going to put it at B tier there. Okay, then we've got the monster stuff now, or, or the, um, uh, what's it called, constructs. So, we've got the uh, the Jet Lion first. Now, previously I thought this was an okay unit to use in Yuan Bo's army, because he, he boosts them a fair bit and reduces their upkeep cost. But with the most recent, well, reasonable, yeah, with 4.2, these ones changed a little bit. And they became less valuable. So if we have a look here from where they're recruited from. I need to go to a major settlement. Alright, so they're recruited from this building here. Which is a high value building. Because it gives you research rate and astromancers. So these ones here, they now have the construct trait. Now this here is detrimental to them. Previously when they had low morale, they would just leave the battlefield. They would just route like any other unit. And that is better than being a construct. Because once this unit has reached low leadership it just dies now 
because it's so difficult to get them to not route after they've taken this much damage and they start taking more damage which hurts their morale even more and now they just die so in a longer stage of a campaign these ones here are actually more problematic now than they used to be not that they were problematic before but now they're just they've actually adding the construct has made them less valuable than they were before so i, I don't think i actually had a tier list with these i can't remember um i'm actually going to put them at b tier i just don't think either of them are really that good are that much of a priority there's a lot of units you're going to be very careful uh sending them up against and you've really got to keep an eye on their leadership if they get to like 30% health, pull them out of combat because don't rely on them on routing because then they'll just die and then you'll have to re-recruit them and there's just not convenient unit to recruit most of the time. I mean, if, once you're in the super late stage of the campaign, you'll be able to globally recruit them in one turn just having a lot of those buildings as a high priority building to get. But again, just these are not units that are really going to be delivering you super value. Like the, the bonuses that they provide, like their special ability, it's just not that big of a deal. And like I said, now that their constructs are actually weaker than they, they were previously, that brings us to the um, Terracotta Sentinels. Now, I believe I put this one at S tier before. Now, if we have a look at it, it's still a tier 5 unit, and it's no longer unbreakable, and it's now a construct. See, these ones here, they were never unbreakable, but this one used to be. And now, if it's leadership, which isn't really that high, if it gets down to about this much health, it's just dead. So these are significantly weaker than they were before. Because previously, you could get it down to like just that tiny sliver of health there and just pull it out of combat and just leave it in the corner of the map because uh, they're fairly quick. But now you've really got to keep your eye on them. So they require more micro. They're not stronger. And so where they used to be S tier, I'm now going to put it at A tier. Still a really good unit, don't get me wrong. You know, spamming these guys here, if you've got the economy for it, you can get a super strong army. But you've really got to keep an eye on them, uh, especially considering that uh, most of your armies aren't going to have tons of healing available to you just because life magic isn't readily available like it is in other uh, order tied factions like Bretonia uh, or um, High Elves or um, the Empire. You're just not going to have readily available uh, life magic to heal them, which they really do need if you want to make them super good. So I'm going to put it at A tier there. Then we've got the Onyx Crowman. Now, I'm not a fan of carrion units, but as far as carrion units concerned, these are not that bad. Okay, they're recruited from two different buildings. So you can recruit them from the barracks, which we have already established we're going to build those. And they can also be recruited from the the uh, like the protection building, the one that gets rid of the um, um, corruption and plague and stuff. Um, I don't consider this one here a high priority building unless you're playing Realms of Chaos which makes no sense because nobody plays that anyway because <laughs> that stops the portals from showing up. Um, and it's a tier 2 unit, which is probably where it belongs. Uh, it's okay. You can boost them a little bit if you got your one bow. Uh, boost them globally. This is an okay unit. I don't think it's something that you should be prioritizing in your armies necessarily. I'm going to put it at C tier. You can, you can get some value out of them, but you really got to keep an eye on them because this is essentially a demon unit now, whereas previously it was a... Um, it, it would just rout. Now, it, if it gets low in morale, it just it just dies. And this is not a strength for it at all. So if we have a look at that, the, um, the elemental unit, it did, however, this gave it extra physical resistance. Whereas these guys here, they didn't get any resistances from being a construct. There's no advantage to being a construct. There's no necrotech that can heal them. They just like straight up got a downgrade for them. So that's why they're further down on the tier list. But this one here, at least it got physical resistance for it, which makes them a little bit more durable up until they reach that point that they just die. Okay, then we've got Celestial Lions. So these units recruited at tier 3 are better than the Lions, in my opinion. Because this is not a demon. If we go and have a look here. It's not a demon unit. It's got some additional effects that, in my opinion, are better than what the uh, the Jaden Jet Lions have. Their upkeep cost is just a little bit higher, but in my opinion, for a unit that's at the exact same tier, this is the better unit to recruit. So I'm going to put this one here. These are essentially either griffins or manticores in terms of how their animations are. And so getting those kind of units at tier 3 is pretty good. So I'm going to put this one here at A tier. Uh, I think you can get a bit more out of them than the uh than the than the um the jade and jet lines especially considering it's flying so you can get it into specific combat uh, a lot easier than these guys because also quicker okay then we've got moonbirds so these are essentially phoenixes that unlike with the high elves 
it's a little bit difficult to heal these guys because that was one of the great things with um with the high elves being able to just have a life wizard attach and heal them constantly so um yuan bow definitely makes a good doom stack with them and these are definitely good mounts for astromancers for sure but as far as how good the actual unit is it's fine I think it's an A tier unit. I don't think it belongs in S tier. You can get a lot of value out of it with its um, with its special Ember Storm thing that it does. Moon Moon Storm. <laughs> What's it called? Hang on, let me find out. Uh, where is it? So here, tier four unit. It's called Moon Flare. That's it. It's pretty good. It's not quite as good as what the um, the Arcane Phoenix could do because I think that one's easier to use. But th this one here actually can dish out more damage. And sometimes ease of use is better than overall power. But good unit, like A tier is a good tier to be in. But due to the lack of uh, availability of heal magic for um, for Cathay, means that they don't end up in S tier. If you if Cathay ever does get access to an actual life wizard that's a hero, this will end up in S tier. And this will return back to S tier. And this will also go to S tier. And these, basically all the single entities will be bumped up one tier if Cathay ever gets access to life magic. Okay, then we've got these two here. So Sky Lantern, trash. <laughs> Just <laughs> probably the single worst unit in the game, short of like the Grail Relic. I hate this unit so much so looking at it right it's a tier three unit it can't land it's super vulnerable its damage output is absolutely pathetic you know you have access to so much better units at tier three i would avoid this unit it just doesn't provide much real value and it's so easy to take out of the sky uh you know if, you, if there's any flying units out there and they target this, you can't really do anything about it. They've got absolutely rubbish combat stats. They don't have that much ammunition. They're just not that good. The only time that they're of any real value at all is if the enemy has no missile units, no flying units, your entire army is hidden, and you can just basically walk up, uh, fly up to them and snipe their lord. That's the only time that these guys become really useful and maybe they should be considered C tier because of that. But that situation is so ridiculously rare and I would just not lean on it at all. Then you've got the Sky Junk, this, which is a complete opposite situation. Sky Junks are really awesome, so I'm going to put that one at A tier. Uh, because it's only one entity, so you, it's the, the Fire Rain Rockets. It's still got the same sort of vulnerability as the, um, the Sky Lantern. But this one here has got a good line of sight on units. You can easily get hundreds of kills against infantry with this. But it's really important to provide it with some support. So having a moon bird protect it, or two moon bird protects it, or, or a um, celestial line, that's really important. See, previously, you couldn't really defend it so well, because I just didn't have other flying units, apart from uh, Jade Longmas, which are higher tier than it, and not really that good. Um, these ones here can protect them a lot better now. Same sort of thing with this, um, but, you know, they're just... D damage output. It's not worth protecting a unit with such little damage output um, when this one here has a so much higher damage output. Okay, then we've got the Wujing Wall Compass. Ugh, not a big fan of this unit. It's not the worst thing ever. Um, I'm going to put it at C tier just because it's kind of cumbersome. It's got, like, if we go and have a look at it, like, it's got some bound spells. It's also got Mastery of the Elemental Winds. But there's so many units in this game that's got Mastery of the Elemental Winds, so I don't consider that a high-value unit. Its combat stats are just not particularly great. Like, having having some of these bound spells... You know what? I'll, maybe I'm being a bit harsh here. I'll put it at B tier, okay? I just don't think that this is a high-value unit because it's not that big of a deal just to have a Heaven's Wizard in your army to be able to cast spells. Um, having a few bound... And plus, the Heaven's Wizard is able to get this as a mount anyway. So, recruiting this as a unit is just... I just don't consider that high priority. But I guess it, it, it can perform okay. Um, I just personally sort of skip them in my army. Okay, then we've got the Zangu War Drum. Not a unit that I've got a lot of experience with, but it's really not so bad. So, looking... so Oh, that's another thing. It's a tier 4. Maybe I should bump it back down again. I'm really not sure. So, the Zangu War Drum... Uh, where is that recruited from? Uh, there it is. So this one here, this one is, in my opinion, sort of like a better version of the Grail Relic. Really what the Grail Relic should be doing. Recruiting one of these in your army is not so bad because what it can do, providing various different effects and a much larger harmony effect. Like if you want to spam nothing but archer units and and have a um, something to actually give them the harmony bonus, recruiting one Zangu War Drum can be really good for that. Um, they're okay in melee, I guess. They're definitely better, in my opinion, than the Wujing War Compass. Um, and they're unbreakable, which is good. 
Uh, I'm going to put that one at B tier as well. Uh, it, it's alright. I, I wouldn't spam them, but putting one in your army if you're going missile heavy, that can be pretty good. You can increase the reload time. Works pretty well with um, the dragon crossbowmen and and the uh, artillery. Okay, then we've got the, the, uh, the grand cannons here. These are pretty good. I'm going to put them at A tier. Because if we have a look over here, they are recruited at tier 3, which is pretty good. There are other factions that are able to recruit uh, cannons lower tier. Like the dwarves are able to get cannons at uh, tier 2, I think. Oh, wait, no. They get catapults at tier 2. So yeah, most factions will get uh, cannons at tier 3. Uh, but the thing is with these ones, they do flaming attack, which isn't necessarily a good thing. But I, I just feel like the cannonballs from these just dish out more damage. They get the same range... Same range as the other types of cannons that are out there, but I just feel like these ones hit a bit harder. Uh, they are a little bit janky, them being carried by oxes, as opposed to uh, horses, I find. Uh, so it could be a little bit janky, but still, um, really good unit. I'm going to put that at A tier. Then we've got the Fire Rain Rocket. This one goes into S tier. The reason for this is this is a shorter range version of the Hellstorm Rocket Batteries that the Empire gets. However, the damage output on these appears to be significantly higher single shot from these guys here basically obliterates infantry so you don't need to get a lot of them they're not overly expensive they're not super high tier like tier 4 is not difficult to get to and you could just get a lot of value out of it and you get four entities out of this compared to this one which is a higher tier unit um, at one entity so th these units here will have the higher damage potential than the Sky Junk. Even the Sky Junk has more ammunition overall, this one has about double, the, a little bit more than double the ammo, because if you take that, you multiply that by four, you've got um, 48 shots compared to 20 over here, because you multiply um, that by how many entities it's got. So there's the tier list there. So you can see here that Cathay has actually got a really good unit roster. You know, having very few units at the lower tier, there's so much you can do with this roster. Um, I usually gravitate to like mostly recruiting the S and A tier units. This is the ones I get the most amount of value from. The currently the Jade Warriors are just I'm just like getting these in just about everywhere apart from the, the legendary lords, which have specific uh, doom stacks that that boost them a bit more. So these are just fa absolutely fantastic. But everything in the Cathay roster performs pretty damn well, in my opinion. I think it's a pretty good faction in terms of its units roster. Very few units that I think are absolute trash. And having you got to have a couple of units in the trash. You can't just be all S tier. If everything is S tier, then really nothing is S tier because it's all relative. But anyway, that's the end of this one here, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. hope you learned something. Subscribe if you've enjoyed it. And if you're interested in Manscaped, check out the link in the description below. You'll be supporting the channel if you do so. Appreciate you, and we'll see you next time. Later, guys.